So next up we have a sort of legacy talk for uh, FOSS in general in India and then a 25 years uh, retrospective of Bombay sla uh, sorry, Bangalore slash Indian uh, Linux user group and to narrate the entire history and in fact the uh, experience of formative years of this tech community tracing its evaluation and during the success of the community we have Dr. Sachin Gar. He's a he has uh, two decades of hand of experience in technology as well as a seasoned fast enthusiast. So without wasting your time, let's welcome Dr. Sachin Gar. Uh, please give a warm round of applause for him. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks a lot for being here. It's nice to see a lot of open source enthusiasts here. So this talk is going to be sort of a trip down memory lane where I'll be talking about how I got involved into the open source community and how the Bangalore slash India Linux users group evolved over a period of time. And this goes back to quite some time, so you'll have to bear with me when I talk about history. So that's the sort of an outline of the talk. And firstly, I would like to dedicate this talk to Atul Chitnis, who has been the driving force behind the FOSS.in and various Linux events and that happened here in Bangalore. He was a charismatic leader. And as the author, uh, speaker before me Rick and, uh, would remember Atul as one of those people, as one of those people who actually drove a lot of Fox. So he had the unique ability to get people of all diverse background together and also engage with corporate in a way that they would actually fund us. So, Atul, we all miss you here. And the motivation behind this speech is actually what George Santayana said, that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And this is very important because a lot of what we are doing is actually a rehashing or reinventing parts of the wheel that were there already over a period of time. So we need to go back into history and see how things have evolved and help and ensure that we build a better community over time. About me, I have been, as you can see, been working with Linux, Unix communities with the OS since 1995. I have a, I'm one of the, I can say that I was one of the earliest people and I've been interested in all aspects of POS and I hold a PhD in public policy and technology. Uh, that I completed a couple, few years back, looking at technology, at, and I'm interested in all aspects of FOSS, so that's what it is, and I'll come back to my beginnings later. The, why I, uh, the internet and FOSS, actually FOSS is, ir, uh, uh, what I should say, is inextricably linked with the internet. The growth of the internet has been, as all of us here would say, been one of the driving forces behind FOSS and its availability to the common world. So why I want to go back to that is when we started out with the India Linux users group, it's important to understand what the state of the internet was in those days. So one of the first things that happened to India, especially to the Indian educational system, was the ERNet, the Educational Research Network which was incidentally set up in 1988. I, I was just going back to my notes and that was a, a bit of a surprise even for me that in 1988 the METI had actually, the DOE had actually set of thought, uh, thought of setting up this uh, system. And there were C-band and terrestrial, C-band VSAT. VSAT stands for, for those who don't know, very small aperture terminals. It's like, it was a terminal the size of your dish slightly larger than that, which used to connect to the satellite. The challenges of satellite communications in the C-band with geostationary are well known. There's a significant amount of quarter se second latency that comes in, but they were one of the best means of communicating and providing high bandwidth connections. High bandwidth, you would say, well, that was the high bandwidth that was there. So on the left-hand side, you would see the terrestrial backbone, and on the right-hand side, it's the satellite van. Note that the thick lines that you see are 64 kilobits per second. On the, and on the satellite van, it was 128 kilobits per second. Remember, I'm talking kilobits, not megabits. 
people get much more bandwidth than this today in their homes. So we as a nation were actually having a few kilobits of bandwidth available joining all the top tier institutes of, the, of India and that is where people were connecting on. So we were all using Netscape browsers on 9.6 or 64 kilobits per second lines. When I was in CDAC, we had a 64 kilobit per second radio link on which 100 people were doing web browsing. Imagine that. And today we all cribble if, uh, if something happens. Uh, I get all these requests that the net is not fast enough even though you got 100 Mbps. At that time, VSNL, now part of Tata Communications, was India's sole international link provider for the, uh, largely for the private sector. There were others like STPI that had a few megabits per second and other ones. And they had 32 megabits, 32 Mbps of total aggregate international bandwidth. One of the things that VSNL did was open up the, what is the called as the Gateway Internet Access Service, 15th August 1995. And that is when the internet was opened up to the general public of India when everyone in India could actually connect to the internet other than a few people who had been lucky enough to use bulletin board services or be part of ERNet. So this is just a thought about how things have changed from since then. Note that on the left hand side 2.0.28 kernel was half a million lines of code while well, now it is an Watpink's 18.5 million lines of code. That's almost a 40 times increase in the size of the kernel itself. Those days, the, uh, up there is what a 9,700 rupees is around 432 rupees today. That means it, the rupee has depreciated almost four times. And in those days, the monthly cost to dial up for a 44.1 kbps connection, if you were lucky, would be around, as you can see, that much money because I'm also adding the connection cost. Connection cost were not free. And today, it's almost 1,000 rupees for a 100 mbps fiber to the home connection. So that's how we have significantly decreased the cost of connecting to the internet and it's basically become free. Connecting to the internet means downloading software, developing it and things like that that come in. Then now I would like to talk about me, myself, and how I got in, involved. This is going to be a bit of a... I grew up in a campus environment. My father was a professor of mechanical engineering at NIT at Harvard. Then it was the REC. And he has be, always been interested in computers, though he was a mechanical engineer, and he did quite sub substantial work, which also got me involved into computers. I played a lot in different types of computers, went to college. I did... VAX, VMS, x86 assembly, but sadly no Unix by the time I was an undergraduate. At my master's, I came back to MNNIT for my master's yeah. in computer science, and there I got my first exposure to Linux and Unix. Not li then my brother had gifted me a computer way back in 1995. You can see the specs there, 486DX with 4 MB of RAM. And then PCQuest came out with its 100th CD, a red color CD that had a lot of from freeware, and incidentally, it also had an OS by 2 warp installation. The OS 2, if for those who may not know it, was IBM's version of a graphical user interface that competed with Microsoft. It wasn't working well enough. PC was bundled it. I tried to wanted to use it as my system, but unfortunately, I did not find that my system was capable enough to handle it, and especially a lack of networking also was a problem. Then I came across this book called Linux Unleashed, which came with a Slackware Linux CD. It was a princely sum of 1800 rupees those days, but somehow I just bit the bullet. We bit the bullet rather, my father paid for it. And we bought the book. I took out the CD, I started learning Linux from the book, installed, uninstalled, reinstalled multiple times, crashed my hard disk, did so many other things that happened with the computer, but lucky, I got lucky. And that's how I got into Linux. So interestingly, at that time, around that time at NMN and IT, we were also discovering the internet. The internet, as you would see, came to us through ERNet. And one of the nearest nodes to MN and IT Allahabad was the IIT Kanpur node. We had set up a small dedicated, a small dial-up 
system for email services. The internet then was only email. We had an email service running on an MS-DOS PC. Every day we would dial up, connect to the IIT Kanpur system server, download the mails, and then distribute it to people. At that time, there was this interesting service called FTP Mail. FTP Mail was a server running somewhere, I forgot who was running it, where you could send an email to the server with a set of FTP file transfer protocol commands telling it what server to connect to, what username password to use, and what software to download. The remote server would do it all on your behalf and send you the software via email, return email. It so happened that I sent a server for, to get the Pine email client. This software was pretty large, and it clogged up the entire, we were just not able to download it, so somebody at IIT Kanpur had to actually del delete the files, and I got a big whacking from the professors there that well, you did something which clogged up the entire email system. Then MNNIT got a 9.6 kbps VSAT link, and to connect that VSAT link to the internet, they were trying to use UUCP, Unix to Unix copy, on the Sun Solaris machine. But that was not getting possible. So I, as my father was a professor there and also a director then, I asked the professor in charge of this that, can we try this newfangled thing called Linux and try to see if we can run the internet on that? He said, yes, no pro harm in trying. And we assembled a Pentium PC, 16 MB RAM, with Slackware Linux, and set up the first DNS email, FTP, and web servers there. And that's how we started getting full-fledged internet access at MNNIT. That name of that computer was sangam.mnrec.ernet.in. Even today, it is sangam.mnnit.ac.in, I think it is. And at that point, we were learning a lot of Linux and networking. To learn Linux networking, we connected by various mailing lists, the Linux kernel mailing lists, the Linux India mailing lists, which had just been started then around that time. The interesting thing we did was, we, because there was a lack of knowledge of Linux among most staff, there were few students of the third and final years who were interested in this, and they were started to work as system administrators, and there are lots of anecdotes about how we worked on those systems. Around that same time, we also got hacked. Somebody was able to come in remotely on the root thing, and that person was Suman Saraf, who was then a student at NIT Surat, and now he is one of the people in the Linux community, and he had gotten remote root access. So his aim in getting in was to tell us that how we got securities and made us learn that people can get remote access. So now I take a small detour on talking about the Linux India mailing lists. This mailing list was run by Sudhakar Thatch and Shekhar from his bedroom in the US. As you can see, it, it had multiple lifts. It ran on the AMD K6, 300 megahertz, 128 MB with Debian 2.8. And this information, I remember uh, I was going through the archives, was actually uh, when he had come and visited us in August 1999. In 96, I moved to Bangalore, and there I connected with Jessica Prabhakar, the lady on the, the uh, white t-shirt there. That was through a mutual connection that I had. A friend, a friend of me, my was a uh, relative. She was one of the people who was very much interested in Linux. I met up with her, and I also connected with Atul and Gopi Krishna. And that's when we, I got plugged into the Linux ecosystem here. So the Bangalore Linux group was set up around that time. It was set up as part of the Linux India group. We had lots of in-person meetings, largely coordinated by Jessica, who became one of the coordinators. We used to have lots of communications, mainly via the email lists. Sadly, the email lists are not available now because they were hosted on Yahoo Groups and Yahoo Groups went away. The meetings were largely held at Hotel Ashraya with a cover charge of 65 to 100 rupees, which, believe me, those days was a significant amount of money. There was also a couple of meetings that were held at some corporate offices. A meeting or two was held at Hotel Atria. And there were eclectic meetings where topics, all sorts of topics were developed were discussed. You could be, go help with this installation, networking, including IPv6. We have been talking about IPv6 since the last 25 years now. And sadly, not many people are still using it. And the projector was sponsored by CDAC. I was the one who used to bring it. And Linux CDs were sold by Mr. UM Taranath. 
and of GT Enterprises. Now, the, uh, the role played by Mr. Taranath of GT Enterprises was significant at this time because, as I've said, the significant cost, huge cost involved in downloading the software, not everybody had access to it. So Mr. Taranath used to burn copies of CDs and sell them. And there was a deal that was struck that in case people had paid the cover charge, they could offset the part, get some sort of a discount from Mr. Taranath, who was sponsoring the meetings also. So, and the cover charges were significant amount, as I said, they were for the hall and the snacks and all. So the June 2000 meeting, we had around 107 attendees. The events that we used to do was, BangaloreIT.com 99 was the first event that happened. It was sponsored by the ITBT department. Mr. Sanjay Das Gupta was one of the key figures there. He himself attended the meeting on 20th August 99 and told us the Linux community why they should have a Linux stall at IT.com. It was held at Electronic City. The PC Quest was sponsoring the main Linux stall and was manned by a lot of Linux India volunteers. I showed, developed a small demo of a Hindi text editor and sadly I couldn't find much many photos of this event. Then there was another event that happened in February of 2000 at Palace Ground called by the Bang Linux, sponsored by Rocks Publications. They have, Sco Unix sponsored one of the Grand Tarantella nights where they were showcasing one of their client server programs. After 2001, the addition shift to Pune, which led to the Bangalore Linux being there. And then in the December of 2000, we had BangaloreIT.com. Now BangaloreIT.com, you can see on the left-hand side, these were heavy, heavy computers that we used to have those days. And that's why it was tough getting these such th things moving and volunteers setting up this. All these photos are the courtesy of Swati and Tariq Sani, who are developers in Nagpur. That small picture on the right side is them with their kid. They, Tariq is a doctor, interestingly, a medical doctor, and they, be, and they came all the way from Nagpur re regularly to attend the meetings. And the left side, we have a picture of all the volunteers and those guys. So some of the folks one can identify is uh, Shankar Balan, the guy with the round glasses. He was in Yahoo. And Kalyan Verma, uh, who's now gotten into wildlife photography. The Linux Bangalore events was one of the first volunteer events. It was held at the first one was held at National Science Seminar Complex. And follow-on events were held. This was the one of the Linux Bangalore events. You can see this star. And then there's a deep root Linux stall here, Abhas and Shiva. So they have had their presence here since 2000. Then I've come to pause.in, which was one of the largest community events. Venues have in included the Jain Tata Auditorium, Nimhans here, and also the Palace Ground in 2005. It was from 2004 to 2011, roughly around that time, and then it died off, and especially after uh, Atul passed away. Wipro sponsored the 2006 edition, and also Google was part of the 2006 edition. This was the 2005 event held at the Palace Grounds. In the middle, you can see we had Alan Cox and Harold Welt coming in. I don't think we have had a visit from Linus Torvalds to these events. Yeah, Linus didn't come, though Richard Stallman had come, and even though Richard Stallman, don't, I don't think he ever came to the was not an event, but he was a regular visitor to India. Eben Moglen used to come of the Free Software Foundation. But Alan Cox was there. Alan Cox, who knows, is the master guy who's behind the Linux network kernel. There were also musical nights, so it was a lot of fun. These were kids. My, my daughter, who's now a college student, and that's Tariq's son. So I'm just saying that there were a lot of people who, are, who had come and contributed, and not only always. And it was a lot of nice, interesting community, which is Lots of young volunteers, lots of people who are see similar today. So that gives me hope that the community will go on. And now I would like to just go back, continue what are the learnings of this, and how the community got over, and what we can learn from this. One is the first one is that building a community requires a strong visionary leader that Atul Chitnis was. He was a guy who could get everybody together and ensure that things got done. Another thing I would say is that open source community is built on meritocracy. I think we should keep all sorts of politics out of it. We need people who are willing to be thick-skinned and listen to a lot of criticism. And then the thing is that the long run, the community has a, to build a symbiotic relationship with the corporates. Because the corporates is where the money is and the real users are. 
We cannot be flaming corporate just because we don't agree with their political ideologies. And we also need a lot of in-person interaction and ensure that online interactions stable, neutral, archival platform. This is especially important as because when I went back to see the history, I wasn't able to because things have shifted to Yahoo groups, Google groups and all of that. A lot of social media is ephemeral. For example, specifically this particular context, I wanted to see where the tickets are available or not, but sadly the website didn't have information. There were posts on the LinkedIn groups, but I mean, uh, unless you follow a group, at least my, I'm an old timer, my first thing would be to go and visit the website and see if there's news which is posted there. So this is just a word of advice to people that when the, the all forms should be there, we should not really rely on only social media as a means of communication. And in-person events are important because they give us the sense of community and the sense of uh, togetherness. So mailing lists, I think we really need to revive them. A reason being that mailing lists have archival value and it takes time and effort to compose a well-written email, which is not necessarily the case in a 280 character tweet or a Facebook post or whatever it is, or a WhatsApp message. So we need people who have the, uh, have the uh, attention span of much more than a few seconds. And future work, based on this and my previous talk at OSI India, where people were talking that we need to really look at how the force has evolved in India, I think we really need to try to chronicle the history somewhere. Earlier, the challenge used to be where's the data. Even now, it is there. So we should really look at whoever is there, the old timers, try to pick their brains, remember what they have. So for example, I was going through one of the old emails in the Linux users group. And it, Atul Smail was there. And he points out that Linux and FOSS were there since 1992, according to people that he had met. But I don't know how much of that some people have passed away, Atul has passed away, Delhi Raj Mathur of SGI was one of the key developers of X and all, he also passed away. So there's a lot of history that needs to be learned and there are ample pu publication opportunities for those who want an IEEE publication. For example, the IEEE Annals of Computer History is a, pub is a A class publication where one can collaborate, force enthusiasts, social scientists, historians, everybody can collaborate and try to do this. Then GitHub has this innovation graph where we can look at how the contributions have changed. So a personal note, I wanted to do my research on the innovation ecosystem around FOSS, in India especially, but when I started looking around, I found that there wasn't enough even data to do some sort of a simple regression analysis or to do stuff like that. So I basically moved away from that topic and said, okay, let me look at other forms of innovation rather than looking at open source. So that's my thing, and I'm happy to connect with everyone here, and any questions, please feel free to ask. Though I may have run out of time. Yeah, any questions? Fine, I think we, thank you. Thank you, Sachin for sharing such a rich history of force around India.